so today I'm going to talk about basically three things, how, how, uh, how we do listening tests at Harman, uh, what, what we consider to be a scientific test, uh, a bit about trained versus untrained listeners, uh, what is a trained listener, why do we use trained listeners when most of uh, our consumers, our, our customers aren't necessarily trained, so uh, why would we design products for, an un, for a trained listener when our customers may not be untrained? Uh, and then I'm going to switch gears and talk a bit about acoustical interactions between speakers and rooms and why that's important. And, uh, and then talk a little bit about how you can use multiple subwoofers to uh, alleviate some of the problems with, with interactions between speakers and rooms, particularly room modes, and how you can uh, use subwoofers to try to cancel some of the modes or not excite them. Uh, so what is a, uh, <clears throat> you know, doing listening tests is something, when I arrived at Harman in 1993, you know, we weren't doing them. And uh, Floyd and I were at the National Research Council, and we were measuring JBL speakers, and some of them were great, some of them were, eh, and there was, it was clear that there was no process in place to uh, measure consistently measure them and evaluate them. And so there were these inconsistencies. So when we arrived, uh, the first thing we wanted to do was start doing controlled listening tests. So why, why, were, why wasn't Harman, and in fact, why most of the industry doesn't do these type of tests is that they're very hard to do and they're very expensive. Uh, you have to, the first thing we had to do was build, you know, a listening room. And we discovered early on that when you you know, like we're doing today, well, we're not doing it today, but if that speaker mover hadn't been built, they would have just lined up four speakers. And each speaker is exciting the room modes differently, and those, those effects can be greater than the differences between the speakers when the speakers are really well designed. So that's, <clears throat> we used to have to uh, do the test and then swap the speakers and bring listeners back in and repeat the test so that we were testing every speaker in every position and that became very time consuming. So, uh, so we built this automa automatic, automated speaker mover. Uh, we started training listeners and I'll talk a bit about that in more detail. And, uh, and then you know Floyd was the first uh, hire in 1991 and then he hired me and then we hired Todd Welty. So we slowly built up a very good staff of people who are uh, considered experts in this field. And today, our group is uh, over 20 people. Uh, we, you know, the, the, most of them are in Northridge, but we have people in uh, China. We have some researchers in Hungary, uh, currently in Armenia as well. We hope to move them from Armenia to Hungary eventually. Uh, but they came from Russia, so uh, we had to... Uh, we had a team of very talented people in Russia, and when the war broke out, uh, we offered them jobs outside of Russia, and initially not many chose to go there, and then there was the draft initiated, and then suddenly we were able to get some. <laughs> yeah, so you can either uh, go on the front lines and get killed, or you can come work at Harmon. <laughs> So I guess life is better than uh, <laughs> You got a new model, Harmon, making life better. <laughs> yes. It's funny. We built a factory, and I'm going off course here. Uh, we built a factory in some place in China. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's right across the river from North Korea, and you can literally swim across, you know, and I, I wondered if they put the factory there hoping that people would be <laughs> swimming over it. And they say, well, we can take you back or we, you can work for us. <laughs> so, so anyway, so we do, uh, we do subjective measurements and we built a lot of facilities, listening rooms, listener training. We also built objective facilities, uh, measure, uh, facilities that we can do measurements. We designed our own test system, which we called Harman Audio Test System, HATS not to be confused with uh, head and torso. <laughs> uh, 
And we, we started doing a lot of listening tests in cars as well. So not only <clears throat> doing listening tests, but measurements. And uh, that I'll talk a little bit about how we do tests in cars. But this was a, an attempt to capture the sound field in the car and then play it back over headphones so that we can, you know, the big issue with car listening tests is that you're in the car, you can see the car, you know how many speakers, it's, it's, a, it's a sighted test. So this is an attempt to do blind tests. And then we have four of these Hanacoic chambers in Northridge, so it allows us to do very uh, reliable, consistent measurements in a, an environment where there's no reflections, so you can accurately characterize the total radiated sound from the speaker. And once you have good objective measurements and good subjective measurements, you can start to correlate the two. Uh, and that's, that's the science of psychoacoustics, which is the relationship between what we perceive and what we measure, or the physical properties of the sound. And that's, that's, the, that's the sort of the nirvana of audio, is if you can measure things reliably and consistently and predict what people hear, then you're, you're far ahead of everyone else. So what is a scientific test? Uh, we, we have some definitions. It has to be sensitive to what you're trying to measure. So if you're playing you know, uh, music that's very entertaining but not re very revealing of problems with the loudspeaker, then uh, that's probably good demo material, particularly if your speaker's not very good. But uh, if you really want to do a hard, difficult test of the speaker, you want to pick music that's very sensitive to problems. And uh, I think the program we have here today, at least is, it tends to be very full bandwidth and spectrally very dense. So if there's any resonances or bandwidth limitations in the speaker, you'll, you'll hopefully hear them. Uh, they have to be repeatable. So that's really, you know, your test itself has to be reliable. So we, we try to automate everything and uh, remove human error from the test process. And then the listener has to be very consistent and repeatable. So if we bring people in one day, uh, they do a test, and we bring them back a week later, we should get very similar ratings within a certain standard deviation. And uh, hopefully the listeners have very low uh, variability, but also between them, they're, they're very consistent. So their opinions aren't all over, over the map. And that's what we had here yesterday. We had people uh, who were giving sort of random numbers. So it, you know, we tried, but we don't, we can't really say it's a scientific test because of that repeatability issue. Uh, the ratings have to be related to real audible differences. What does that mean? Uh, we want people who are <clears throat> uh, judging things what, based on sound only, not based on how it visually looks, how much it costs, you know, whether it has 10 transducers in it. Uh, we want to remove that some from the test, and that's very easy. Uh, you put a curtain up, and uh, you make sure it's acoustically transparent, but it's visually opaque so that they can't see what's be behind the curtain. And when people go in and do the test, they don't know what they're going to listen to. They don't know what the brand is, what the pr prices are. Uh, they're really in the dark. And then lastly, uh, we want to control all the other nuisance variables, which uh, we have here. We basically have them in three categories. The category on the left has to do with uh, psychological or physiological variables, sighted biases, uh, whether the listener's hearing is, is normal. So uh, the first thing we do when we recruit listeners is do audiometry tests. And if they have uh, significant hearing loss, more than 10 or 15 d uh, dB or hearing loss in dB, then uh, they're rejected from the test or they're rejected from the pool. So that automatically eliminates all the JBL Pro engineers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you listen to Nirvana? Yeah, I love Nirvana. Well, sorry. <laughs> uh, he heavy metal people, maybe not so much. Uh, experience. Uh, Expectations. So that's really, if you're aware of what's in the test, you have certain expectations. So that's removed from the, from the test by putting the curtain down. <coughs> Group interaction. Well, that's a, that's a big variable today in this room because 
uh, we have people here, and if you're like me, when I hear something really bad, I go, whoa, and that sends messages to other people that, you know, all of thinks this sucks, and maybe I thought it sucked too, but if all of says it sucks, it must be really good, or, you know, people, so you send body language, you may vocally say something, and uh, for that reason, we typically do tests with one listener at a time, so there's, there's no group interaction. So today, hopefully, you'll control your emotions when you hear something bad or something really good and not talk to one another or share any information uh, out, out in the hallway if we take a break. Um, these are all acoustic uh, nuisance variables, so uh, absolute level, obviously, if we're testing little tiny Bluetooth speakers, this is where I've really had issues where uh, the, the volume that you set the test at can determine the outcome because all of these speakers are very limited, uh, limited amplifiers, limited excursion, and they only play up to a certain loudness. At, at, at one point, the limiters kick in and the bass just starts dropping, and uh, depending on what level I set, I can, I can affect the outcome of the test. With big speakers like we're hearing today, it's not really an issue. We're not going to listen at uh, you know loud, damaging ear sound pressure levels. Uh, we did take careful um, control today to adjust the relative levels. So John put a microphone up. We were playing pink noise, full band pink noise, C weighted. Uh, levels and uh, we think they're very close and level. You may hear some differences uh, depending on the track, but overall they should be very close. And that's important because if a speaker is louder, your perception of its spectral balance may change because our, our perception of timbre is level dependent. At very low levels, we don't hear bass as well. Uh, it's pretty well defined by these equal loudness contours that you've seen published. And uh, for that reason, we want to make the relative loudness the same. Speaker location, uh, well, we know that if you line four speakers up, they will couple into the room modes differently. So we built this automated speaker mover that, that you know, a speaker sh comes up, the other one goes down, goes back, and then this one goes back, the other one comes up. So that all happens in three or four seconds. Uh, which is, a, is about how fast this guy behind the screen is today. I think. <laughs> that, that's his standard, eh? That, that's his. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so speaker location is a factor. Listener location is a factor. Obviously, uh, you can move the speaker or the listener, and you'll, you, the, the bass will be different, and the pattern of reflections will also be different. Uh, program material, uh, we, we know because of the circle of confusion, that your perception of a, how good a speaker sounds will depend on the music, its bandwidth, how well it was recorded, and if it was recorded poorly, uh, the speaker may be compensating for some weakness in the recording. For example, if, this, if the recording doesn't have very much bass, maybe, you, maybe a boomy speaker would compensate for that, and you like the boomy speaker. Similarly, with, with brightness, that's usually a, a factor. If it's a very bright recording, a dull speaker may make it sound actually neutral. So you have to carefully choose your music, uh, not only for full bandwidth, but also to uh, uh, be fairly well balanced. And you, you can judge that by evaluating the, the recordings through neutral speakers. What else? Yeah, so this has always been very controversial, whether uh, we do all of our tests using a single mono speaker. And uh, this goes all the way back to the 80s, where Floyd Toole uh, wrote a paper called, uh, where, I don't know what he called it, stereo versus mono. And he, he did a study where he, he evaluated speakers in mono, and then he evaluated them in stereo. And he found that people were generally more sensitive to spectral irregularities when they were listening to a single speaker. Uh, and I, I did a follow-up study a few years ago where I did it in mono, stereo, and then 5.1. And we found, as you went from mono, uh, people were very critical, and the, the separation and ratings were like this. In stereo, the separation gets smaller, and you go to 5.1, then it gets, you know, very, 
people have trouble hearing these differences. So hearing a single source it tends to be very the, the most sensitive condition. And some people say, well, if I, if I have 7.1.4, uh, I can get away with uh, poor speakers because, we, you know, science says that's, that will be the case. But that's not the case because uh, the way recordings are made and films are made, typically you have most of the contents coming from a single speaker, the center channel, all the dialogue, uh, you know, uh, music vocals, if you're listening to multi-channel music, the vocals hopefully coming from the center. So you, you have to really consider worst case situation, which is a, a single source with a signal going to it. Uh, I joined Harmon in 1993, and I was probably the least popular hire in the last 30 years because, as I said previously, we, Harmon wasn't doing listening tests, not controlled tests. And there was, the culture at the time was we, we don't need to do these. It was like forcing people to get COVID tested or uh, wear a mask. You know, we don't want to wear a mask. We don't want to do blind tests. And so I had to prove, uh, the first job I had to do was prove that people were biased. And there hadn't, this hadn't really ever been done. We know from, you know, drug studies, they have placebos and they know that uh, if you're told this, you're taking this drug, it will, it can affect your recovery rate. Uh, so they always do controlled studies in medicine and mo most sciences, but for some reason in audio, 99% of all subjective reviews we read are done under cited uncontrolled conditions. And this has naturally, you know, found its way inside, inside of audio companies. And, uh, you know, the common complaint was, well, I'm a trained professional an engineer. I've been doing this for years. I, I'm not influenced by price and whatever. Uh, so... Okay, so I, I brought in, I don't know, 40, some 40 employees, and we set up four loudspeakers, and uh, we brought them in. We did the test blind, and then a few days later, they came in and did the same test sighted. And these were four different loudspeakers. Uh, speaker G and D were the same loudspeaker, same drivers. G, <clears throat> it was a, a multi-way JBL TI 5000 or... I think that's the model number, but they were about five thousand dollars a pair. Beautiful uh, maple finish, so they're very well finished drivers, uh, very deserving of their price tag. And uh, so we're, we're trying to throw a wrench into the test. The other wrench was that at the time G was the same speaker, but voiced by a German uh, specialist who believed he had the, you know. Uh, he believed that he knew what German tastes were, and he voiced this loudspeaker with, uh, with a German taste in mind, whatever that was. Uh, it had more expensive crossover components in it, more of them, so the cost of making the speaker was, was much larger than D, which was voiced in Denmark. Uh, and uh, the Danish crossover was more or less voiced, you know, for... Northern European taste. I, I don't even know if he believed it was voiced for, he just voiced it to be neutral. And, and they were very similar. They weren't, this is not a huge difference, but yet we were selling both, both speakers uh, in Europe on this notion that there were differences in taste. So the interesting thing was in the, in the blind test, these speakers, people could not reliably distinguish between them. Uh, there, or at least in terms of preference, they gave them the same scores. So that it was a statistical tie. This speaker was our first effort in a home theater in a box. It was a JBL sound effects, a little tiny satellite speaker, a subwoofer, and it was about $800, if I recall. And this was a, a $4,000 uh, competitor, competitor speaker, uh, Teal 3.6, I believe. And uh, so anyways, you can see basically the first two in the, in, the site, in the blind test were tied. The sound effects, the $800 plastic speaker was slightly less preferred, and it was equally preferred to the teal. So basically we have these two JBLs scoring slightly better than the, uh, the theater, home theater in a box and the teal. 
So we brought them in the next couple of days later, and suddenly the big expensive JBLs, they can see them, the scores go way up. Uh, the cheap home theater in a box goes way down. And this competitive speaker, they didn't really uh, change, change the score much, but they thought that the big expensive competitor speaker was now better than the home theater in a box. So proof that, uh, you know, if you can see what you're listening to, it affects your, your judgment. The other thing that's not shown here is that these were all in different positions, and we, in the blind test, we found strong positional effects that affected the scores. We also found strong program effects in the blind test. And, and when we did the sighted test, the speakers always scored the same. We could move the speaker around. The scores just tracked as if there was no effect and same with the music. So people were not really reporting what they were hearing in the sighted tests at all. They, were, uh, they weren't as discriminating, and they weren't reporting these, these effects that were observed in the, in the blind test. So from that point on, we, all of our tests uh, were done blind. And, uh, and we published this paper uh, in the AES, and it, it caused a lot of a lot of people were glad to see it. A lot of people were not glad to see it, particularly the people who make a living doing sighted tests. Oh, by the, by the way, we stopped making the German uh, speaker after this test. It was discontinued because it was expensive and no one. We even had Germans come in and listen to it, and they didn't. So it sounds the same to me. <laughs> so unfortunately, the, the German engineer was uh, let go, and the, the art of German voicing was forever lost. <laughs> so uh, in, in 2015, uh, I'd finished my PhD research, and it involved doing uh, listening tests of speakers that had different off-axis responses, and I repeated in four different rooms. And it turned out in the original MLL, this, uh, these speakers didn't do as well. Uh, the differences were not as audible in this room, and the reason was these sidewalls were very, very distant from where the listener was sitting. So by the time the reflections got back to the listener, they were really attenuated compared to a, a, a smaller room with, with uh, closer sidewalls. And, and in that room, the differences were very audible. So what I did was I had the walls brought in closer to the listener, and uh, that, that was basically the the reasoning behind it. We added some uh, some more sophisticated software for measuring and uh, gathering all the data and doing all the analysis. And uh, 2004, uh, we built this room called the reference room, and it was really driven by a need in our automotive group to have a standardized room in all the Harman locations where people can come in and evaluate a system in, in the same acoustical environment, and then uh, in automotive, they would come in here and then go to the car and then evaluate the car. So they're, they're using a reference uh, against which they judge the car. That's why it's called the reference room. We also built a, uh, in Northridge, we had a need to build a, a three-sided wall that could move very quickly between either, look, either position, and that was for doing different different speakers that were intended to be mounted on the wall, like an in-wall speaker. But we could also test on walls, near walls, and uh, desktop speakers like this that uh, would, would go on this little ledge, and then we'd bring in a desk that's cut out, and the whole thing could spin in either, either direction. Uh, so that was... Uh, that was another way to do blind tests on, on different types of speakers. And, uh, you know, Harman's now part of Samsung, and there's a Samsung research lab up in Valencia, not far from where we are. And they actually have walls that can spin, and they put television sets on them, and they evaluate, <clears throat> evaluate the sound quality of TVs using these big spinning walls. It's pretty impressive. So uh, these are the locations where we have these Harman reference rooms, and you can see most of, most of these locations are where we have automotive uh, facilities where they're 
that are involved doing car research and car audio system evaluations. Now, in the last three years, uh, Harman X, which is our research group that I'm part of, uh, we're really focused on immersive audio, and the reference room has now been turned into a, an immersive listening space. So we have uh, a large middle layer of speakers, a large uh, height layer, and then we also have uh, floor, floor speakers that we can bring in if we want to do uh, testing on uh, bottom layers. And uh, a week or so ago, we had our automotive people visit us, and they've decided they would like to do something like this as well, because currently most of the rooms are 7.1. And uh, with Atmos Music now, uh, you're going to see more and more cars with Atmos Music systems. So we have to obviously have a, a reference room where we can evaluate Atmos Music. Uh, this is a, a lab in Northridge that we built as, as part of this switch over to immersive audio. Uh, this is basically a, a very uh, elaborate frame uh, with an arc of speakers every 10 or 15 degrees. And uh, there's a, a chair which <clears throat> goes up or down. And we can, we can rotate the chair and we can quickly measure people's head-related transfer functions. Does anyone know what head-related transfer functions are? I'll explain. Uh, so the way we localize sound is, uh, is when something arrives at your ears, there's always time delay differences. When the, if, you're, if I'm over here, it arrives at this ear sooner than this ear. And there's also, because of the head shadow effect, there's, there's intensity differences, so it's going to be louder at this ear. But uh, when we have sounds in the, circ in the uh, cone of confusion where there's really no time differences or intensity differences, we rely totally on spectral cues, which is related to our pinna. So ele elevation in particular is very, there's these notches at 8 kilohertz, for example, that are very important. And the problem is that it varies from person to person, right? We're all built differently. Uh, our heads are different sizes our necks, our shoulders, which are important for certain cues, and of course our pinna. So this allows us to measure everyone's <clears throat> HRTFs, which helps, is basically the filters that define how we localize sound. And in the last uh, couple of years, we've measured over 350 people, uh, very diverse, so equal number of women and men, different ethnicities, uh, different ages, so we have a very, very large and diverse set of HRTFs. We also did scans, uh, laser scans of their head, and that allows us to come up with 3D CAD models of their head, and then we can 3D print their heads as well as their ears and have very accurate representations of, of a listener. So, for example, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we, you know, if someone wanted my opinion on a car in China, and I, I didn't want to fly over to China, I could just send my head over to China. <laughs> I, if, I don't know if it would get through customs, but <laughs> we, we can't seem to get a speaker through customs. I don't know about a head, but, but that's, that's one of the applications. Uh, one, of, one of our projects was to see if we could develop a, a more average uh, <clears throat> human head based on our large database is something that's more average than, say, a, a Kimar or a, a B and K hats. You know, Kimar was based on a very small sample. I think, Eric. Yeah, the um, actually the Seven Eleven coupler, as we kind of called it internally, that's kind of a different name now. But early on, was based on uh, a coupler is got a microphone in it and a cavity of air that represents what the ear canal would be. Um, and uh, the hearing industry started that a long time ago, and it was based on the research of three people. One person's data wasn't good, so they threw it out, so it was two people. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I think it might be better to have a, you know, a, <clears throat> a mannequin that's based on more than, you know, three or four white Danish guys. Uh, 
Yeah, the other point, they were all engineers in the lab, so yeah, white Danish guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, anyways, one of the things that came out of this project is we now have a an average, uh, the, the metoid of a human being, and we can use it to uh, do many things. One, one is we can put it in a room and sample the reverberation in the room, and that's have very realistic reverberation that's, that most people will be pleased with when we're doing 3D audio rendering, for example. Uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of studies on how these how headphones fit and seal on because I have all the uh, anthropomorphic data of all these people and I can print their heads and measure headphones on them and see what uh, you know does this headphone fit on a large distribution of heads that we've we've tested so um, so yeah so the the next question is training listeners and why why would we want to train listeners well we already knew from uh, early on that trained listeners generally give more reliable, more repeatable data, and they tend to be more discriminating. So they can hear small differences, and those small differences tend to matter more than, say, an untrained person. We, we brought people in from outside from time to time, and like yesterday, the, the, you know, the, 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 the results were disappointing. The trained listeners could clearly distinguish them, <clears throat> on, you know, separate them on a scale, but uh, people are all over the map when they're untrained. So that's that's one reason. And that has practical consequences if you want to get very good data uh, very quickly with the lowest cost, you can use fewer trained people than, say, bringing in untrained people. Uh, as many as 8 to 20 times fewer listeners. So that, that adds up to a lot of money and time. The other thing is when we train people, we train them how to describe, you know, timbre, spatial quality, dynamics. And when we, you know, we're not only interested in their preferences, but we want to understand why they like or dislike something. And uh, a trained listener can tell you that in very precise language. We can actually teach people to draw on a frequency graph what the spectral balance is. So if they think it's flat and neutral, they'll draw a flat line. If they think it has... It's boomy. They may draw the, uh, a, a bump at you know 80 hertz. If they think it's dull, they'll actually draw a, a shelf filter uh, with a cut at say two or three kilohertz. And these, yeah. Do you ever um, stage like a blind test where you have maybe a live performance, record it, and then play it back on speakers so the trained listeners actually have to compare it to live, or is it always one speaker versus another? Yeah, what you're describing is live versus recorded, and I've I've written about that on my blog extensively. Um, it's it, it there's some lot there's a lot of flaws in that process. I mean, the first one is uh, the recording. Uh, you know, the recording may not necessarily capture what? accurately what what they heard. Uh, but no, it's it's the training is generally uh, list you know comparing speakers, comparing headphones, but also over headphones or speakers, comparing things that have been modified and simulated using filtering and DSP. So uh, that's a little more repeatable, and uh, it can also be adaptive, which I'll, I'll explain in a second. So, so some of the attributes of sound, uh, you know, there's been a lot of study done in this, but there's basically four attributes. Uh, five, if, if you include loudness, timbre, which is the, the perceived spectral balance, and ideally, uh, in the training or in, in the product design, you want to have as low coloration as possible because those resonances will color and change the harmonic structure of the, the music. The dynamics will it play loud enough without audible distortion. Spatial dimensions, uh, there's several of these, so e everything here is very multi-dimensional and. Uh, that, that's the challenge. Uh, spatial dynamics, there's the localization aspect, where are you hearing it, the distance as well as the angle. Uh, the apparent source width, so is the vocalist very small or is the vocalist very wide? <clears throat> are you hearing different parts of the vocalist? Is, is it, are, the, are there separate images? That can happen sometimes. Uh, the size of the sources. Uh, and then there's envelopment and spaciousness, which uh, 
is an important attribute of feeling like you're actually in the space. And con concert halls, most of the work has been done there in, in Velement. And they found that uh, the uh, perception of, you know, the, the sense of envelopment is strongly related to the strength of the lateral reflections. So for that reason, very shoebox-shaped concert halls tend to be preferred over fan-shaped concert halls. And in the context of stereo reproduction, speakers that have wider dispersion or uh, that produce strong reflections will tend to sound more spacious than uh, a speaker that's highly directional. Now with multi-channel, uh, you have sources all around you, so there's the opportunity to have, you know, your cake and eat it too. You can have a f directional source, but because it's creating those reflections, I th you know, it's possibly, I think an argument can be made that directivity is maybe less important. Yeah? Can I back up to your last slide? Not that we have to go there, but at one time you had a trained listener program that was available so you could like become a better trained listener. Does that still exist or? That's my next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you for the introduction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway. yeah, here we go. <laughs> so, someone asked about this yesterday, so I decided to throw it in. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, Harmon had a listen. This is old now, and it's no longer supported. And it's, uh, it no longer works on Mac since Mac went 64-bit. The OS went, is it 64-bit? Yeah. Uh, OS, it no longer works. The Windows version still works. You can download it at that link. And uh, it uh, basically starts out very s easy, uh, you know, in this case two bands, and it gets more and more difficult, and obviously it's more difficult to, uh, when you have all these options and you have to select which one you th believe is being active. <coughs> it automatically gives you feedback every time you get a wrong answer and you can go back and hear what the right answer was. It gives you a, a score. It start, you know, you start out at level two and it can go all the way to level 20. And as a minimum criteria for being a trained listener at Harmon, you have to get up to level eight. And here, here's an example. You, <clears throat> you listen to the music track, you hit EQ, you hear, you know, there's a change in the sound. You have to figure out whether it's, uh, is it here, is it here, is it a peak or a dip, and what the frequency is. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, if you get three wrong, you have to get three right answers at any given level before it skips ahead to the next level, and then it adds additional peaks and dips. So uh, when I first started using this, I, uh, I, I had one guy, there's always cheaters, right? He, he hooked up a, spec, a spectrum analyzer to his <laughs> PC, and he was, and this, the, the motivation was we, we used to give rewards to the listener with the highest score every month. <laughs> the same, same guy was like scoring 100 every, every time. So we, we found out that he, he was cheating. <laughs> I tried that for the first time before coming here. Mm -hmm. John had sent his links. And I didn't do any prep or anything. I just had 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I'm going to try it. And um, I was using some of the JBL 306B, the little power desktops. Mm -hmm. And I was doing real well up until we got into about seven bands of EQ. And then I started misidentifying, you know, like I'd pick five instead of six or six instead of seven as to which band. Yeah. Um, I was doing in the... 70th to 80th percentile up until that point. Then I started dropping a little bit. Um, and then I had to guess on some because the speakers wouldn't do some of the real low stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, well, if I can't hear the difference, it must be one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's, so that's why you need full band with headphones or speakers because you can't, at some point you start guessing. And the other thing is you need full band with music because if, if we're activating a peak here and there's nothing in the signal, you're not going to hear it. So this, this will confirm that you need to pick wideband music and, you know, have wideband, good, accurate headphones or, or speakers when you're doing this training. 
you know, don't do these on, on your Apple MacBook Pro laptop because those <laughs> speakers, they die at 200 hertz. So, so that's the training. Now, early on, uh, I got uh, <clears throat> questioned by a fairly prominent researcher in this field <clears throat> who said, uh, he challenged me and he said, well, why are you using trained listeners when naive people, uh, consumers, are untrained? And the example he used was wine, because he was, you know, in, in the audio industry, a lot of the, uh, often they go to food and wine. Uh, there's a lot of sensory profiling and research done in food and wine. And they find that, you know, you use expert people to describe the profile of the wine, but when you want to actually go and uh, test it, you get all kinds of untrained wine drinkers and you measure their preferences uh, because they find that experts will like different wine than non-experts. So <clears throat> I've always argued that uh, wine, and f wine and audio is not the same because in, in audio you have references. You have your example, the live versus recorded. You could <clears throat> make a recording of my voice in this room play it back through the speaker and then compare my voice to the rec reproduction, then you could say, no, that's, you know, the recording has sibilance, it's boomy, whatever. And, you know, we walk around all day hearing lots of natural live sources, and I think we use that information when we do these tests. We, we know when something's off. I don't think there's references in, in wine. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it's it's a grape, and it's it's like a <clears throat> it's like a piece of music where the winemaker will blend things and add things and do different things to it to turn it into something that he thinks is an art. And I think with with audio, uh, you know, music and the recording is the art, but when it comes to drinking wine or listening to the recordings, you pick you pick a wine glass. That's uh, very transparent. You know, you don't see usually wine experts drinking out of rose-colored crystal. They want a transparent wine glass so they can describe the, the true color. And my argument is the speaker should be this, the wine glass. It should be transparent. And also uh, so you can hear the true color of the music and the recording. And I came up with this analogy years ago, not, not only because of this, this uh, famous researcher, but in Harman we had, uh, we, we started selling speakers, the Rebel speakers in Japan, and our Japanese distributor was arguing that our Rebel speakers are very boring, They're, they sound like distilled water. And uh, you know, I, I thought that was a huge compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, speakers are, he says, it's, it's like, and he started using wine analogies. I said, no, I said, speaker is the wine glass. It should be transparent. It should sound distilled. Uh, it, it's the music and the recording that, that are the flavor. So luckily, uh, we, didn't diver we didn't diverge from, you know, from neutral and, and accurate, and, and eventually that guy uh, was, no, he's no longer at Harman, so we don't have to worry about it. But that's a common thing, unfortunately. There's, there's two views in audio. One is go neutral, go accurate, uh, reproduce what the artist intended, and, that, and the, other, the other approach is, you know, make it colorful, make it exciting, uh, make it inaccurate. Yeah? Is that can you sort of by any chance? Uh, I can't remember his name. It just escaped me. Yeah. Uh, if, if you turn off the video. So anyway, that's, that's philosophy. It's, you know, you can't act on philosophy. We have to act on hard data. So we, fortunately, over the years at that time, we, we were running a lot of tests in our MLL. We we're bringing in lots of dealers, reviewers, uh, various customers, and uh, we compared the results of these four loudspeakers to the Harman trained listeners. So these are 12 Harman listeners. Uh, those are averages, and the bars are standard deviations. And these are groups of 10, 10 to 20 people, and you can see their, their bars are much larger, so as a group and as individuals, they're not as consistent. And they're rating everything higher on the preference scale. 
But if you look at the at the uh, overall ranking, the rank order, they're very similar. So I, I think we can safely say that uh, uh, this represents over 250 listeners that uh, regardless of training, uh, people generally agree on what's a good speaker and what's, what's not a good speaker. You know, this speaker here, uh, <clears throat> people were pretty, pretty uniform in saying it's not very good. The Harmon listeners, all 12 of them gave it zero. There's like no, you can't see a standard deviation there. So, uh, I mean, that's one thing with a, a trained listener. They have no, no uh, charity at all when they hear something they don't like. <laughs> and they're, they're a little more st stingy when it comes to giving out high ratings, which is interesting. But, uh, but the bottom line is uh, if a trained listener likes it, an untrained listener will really like it. And, you know, we have a, uh, I came up with this uh, way to quantify how good you are as a listener. And it's, <clears throat> it's based on, if you do an ANOVA on the individual listener, you can, you get an F statistic. And an F statistic is a measure, uh, it's a ratio of two things, how discriminating are they and how re repeatable are they. So if they're discriminating, the, the means between the different speakers will be large. And if they if you give the same number every time for each speaker, there'll be a low error bar, and that produces a very large F, F statistic. So if you normalize everything to 100%, uh, the trained listeners are 100%. Audio reviewers were 35% is good. Retailers. Sorry, retailers. That's people like us. Yeah, yeah, people like you. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Retailers are, they hear a lot of different products. They, you know. They're exposed to, uh, and they may, maybe they've done these tests before, if you know, if only informally. Audio reviewers that we brought in were about 20% as good, and that caused a lot of controversy. They're the guys that don't need the blind test, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, one year I, I proved that audio viewers do blind tests and they're biased, and then I followed up with a study that showed they're not very reliable listeners. So. Uh, I had to, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now this this is interesting. These are Harmon marketing and salespeople, who before I arrived, these are the people that voiced our products. You know, they were they got all, the last say in whether something was ready to go out the door, and it turned out they were among the worst listeners in the whole group. That's probably why you got hired. Yeah, so <clears throat> they, they didn't like that as well, but they felt relieved that they were off the hook, that they, you know, they no longer have to decide whether the speaker's ready to go. So that they liked the scientific process because uh, I guess they believe in it, but it also, uh, they're not on the hook for if a product does poorly because of how it sounds. You know, they, can blame, they can blame us. College students, the worst listeners, uh, it's not that they were unreliable. Uh, the, the real issue was they were not discriminating, so they gave all these products very high scores, couldn't, couldn't differentiate. And my only explanation is uh, this was when uh, MP3 first started coming out and people were listening to Bluetooth speakers and uh, Apple air, earbuds, and they, uh, they probably never heard good sound before. Certainly they probably were not exposed to good bass, and these were all speakers five to ten to eleven thousand dollars each. So these these had powered subwoofers, and they, they had lots of bass. That wasn't the issue. So to these college students, they just said, "I, I love them all. I'll take any one home, <laughs> any one of them home." And you can see that here here are the the measurements, which I'll explain in a second. But these are this is the on-axis response, and they're very generally full wide band with lots of bass. Uh, so that wasn't really, this one doesn't have much bass. But uh, they're all pretty good speakers and yet you start to see differences when you go off axis. This, this one in particular has a big dip where the mid-range crosses over the tweeter. The directivities don't match well so there's a, it sounds very colored particularly if you're sitting off axis. And this one you can see is just uh, all kinds of resonances. It's very directional, 
and you can see that as you move off axis, it gets actually more balanced. So this is a speaker that sounds better when you're sitting, you know, 45 degrees off axis. So there's a very, if you, there's a very strong visual correlation between how it measures and how it sounds. And you would think, I mean, you wouldn't have to do much explanation to get a consumer to understand, perhaps, that this is good sound, this is bad sound. I don't know. Is that called in-room response? No, these are all anechoic measurements. Can you speak to the Harman room response? Yeah, I'm going to be talking about that. So, you know, this, this is not... So I, I've shown you some examples of measurements which we've known now since like 1985. Floyd Toole did the first uh, real published study in 1985. He, he, he published two papers in the AES and showed uh, the correlation between subjective and objective measurements. And it was very clear back then that, uh, that you could predict good sound based on measurements. It took, you know... 20 years for people to realize it and start applying it. You know, some people started applying it sooner than others. The Canadian loudspeaker industry started applying it quickly because we were working in Canada and they were coming up all the time and they, were, they started to subsidize some of the work. So they were clearly interested in this. But today, I think it's generally true that most speakers are, are following the science. But... Uh, Something happened around 2002 where uh, <clears throat> Consumer Reports, which is a, a magazine that tests dishwashers, fridges, stoves, cars, and speakers, they were publishing these accuracy ratings of speakers from 0 to 100 in terms of you know, 100 being the most accurate loudspeaker and 0 being the least accurate. And it was totally based on a single measurement in an anechoic chamber and uh, it was third octave based, so any resonances, medium, high Q, would be completely smoothed and ignored. And they argued that the sound power alone is the most predictive of how it sounds. And they said the sound power should be flat, and, uh, which is totally opposite of how we design speakers. And uh, we started to get bad speaker reviews, and Floyd had been there. I don't know, I'd been there for five, six years. And uh, Floyd was hauled into the CEO's office, and he said, Tool, we're paying you all this money. We picked this guy all of what, what the hell are you guys doing? Our speakers are getting bad reviews. And Floyd said, well, that's because their measurements and their models of how to predict sound are wrong. And we've known this for years, but they won't listen to anyone because... They're uh, a consumer testing organization, and they won't deal with manufacturers. So he says, well, can you design to their criteria? And he said, no, we'd have to compromise the sound of our, our products. And other reviewers would, would say it sounds terrible. So, so he said, uh, Floyd said, well, we'll prove that they're wrong. So I set out on this 18-month project where I went out and bought all their speakers, uh, that they just reviewed 13 bookshelves, and I tested them very thoroughly over many months and looked at uh, the relationship between their scores, accuracy scores, and our preference ratings in the measurements, and I came up with a model that <clears throat> they could use to predict more accurately how the speaker sounds. Uh, but first, you know, I'll just go through... The measurements that we use, this, these, these have been known for some time. This is called the spinorama because we put the speaker in the chamber. We put a microphone two meters out and we rotate. We do a measurement and then we re rotate it every 10 degrees all around. And then we flip it over on the side and we do the vertical orbits. And <clears throat> we, do, we use 1 20th octave resolution. You know. We could actually uh, use even higher, but that's, that's what it was at the time. And then we do spatial averages to uh, help us identify the contribution of the direct sound, the, the early reflected and the late reflected. So I'll explain to you what, what a spinorama is. This first curve is the listening window, and it's an average of plus or minus 30 degrees horizontal. Plus, plus or minus 10 degrees vertical. 
And that represents what you would hear if you were sitting in a room, uh, sitting you know, on axis or slightly off axis to the loudspeaker. And <clears throat> this happens to be a good loudspeaker, so it's, it's very flat and smooth. We know that people like that when, when, when it's in a loudspeaker. Uh, this next curve is the early reflections, and that represents the first side wall, back wall, front walls, floor, ceiling. Uh, measured at angles, uh, you know, we went and did a survey of, I think, 17 different setups in consumer home, and that was used to calculate what the angles are that eventually arrive at the listener. And then <clears throat> the last, uh, the next curve is the sound power. And this is the average of the weighted total radiated sound from the speaker. So if you were sitting in a reverberation chamber, uh, this might be what you would hear if we put a speaker in that room. So it's a, it's a totally reflective room, no absorption. And this is what Consumer Reports was uh, using to calculate sound power scores, or sorry, uh, accuracy scores. And you can see, because the speaker is directional, uh, <clears throat> at higher frequencies, it starts to roll off. <clears throat> Consumer Reports said, you know, th this is a bad sounding speaker, according to a theory, because this sound power is not flat. It's rolling off, and uh, it's, it would get a low score, even though it looks textbook, textbook perfect. So to make this get a high score in Consumer Reports, we would have had to boost everything up so that the sound power would come up and be flat. And then the, these last two curves are the, the, the directivity indices. So this gives you a, a measure of how directional the speaker is as a function of frequency. And you got the sound power, the blue one, which is the difference between this and this. And then the DI for <clears throat> first reflections is the difference between this curve and this curve. So a, as a as a curve, it's not very indicative of the quality of the speaker because it, it, you know, I could have a sound power that looked like one of those previous speakers. You know, everything had this going in all the curves. So it would have a very smooth directivity, but it, the speaker sucks, right? It's got all these resonances. So this, all this tells you is that a, a good sound power should, have, should be very smooth and not have huge transitions where you get a mismatch, because those, those mismatches in directivity will cause uh, problems in the, on the direct sound or the, the sound power. So, <clears throat> so anyway, I, I did all these tests, and I came up with a model. And uh, it was, uh, I was able to, to predict the accuracy of listener scores with 86% 86, 86 correlation. And it used uh, weighted metrics applied to the direct sound as well as the off-axis uh, based on what I call deviations from <clears throat> ideal behavior. So ideal behavior would be on-axis listening window flat, smooth, extended, and then the off-axis curve should be smooth. Now, <clears throat> so it turned out that the, the model has equal weighting to the direct and the reflected sound. So. You know, in the case of Consumer Reports, they were just weighting 100% the sound power, totally ignoring the direct sound. And in my model, the sound power is, you know, 30%. I didn't point this out, but the Consumer Reports model, I think it only went down to 100 hertz or something around there, which meant that it didn't, it didn't really consider bass. And in my model, the bass was weighted 30% of the preference. So <clears throat> it's a little wonder that uh, there was no correlation between consumer reports and what people like. And we, we published this paper, and then we sent a copy to consumer reports, and they said, uh-oh. Uh, so they stopped publishing speaker reviews for, I think, over a year. And uh, we kind of forced them to revisit how they do tests. And I don't, I don't think uh, anyone could have convinced them unless they'd gone through the scientific approach and they'd actually published their paper. Because I, I published this in Consumer Reports. It was a bit embarrassing for them. So 
It was a win for science. And we started to get better reviews after this, too. <laughs> so, yeah, so the quality of bass is weighted 30%. And that means when you put the speaker in a room, the room totally dominates the quality of bass. So you can't ignore the room when you, you know. And of course, you know, Harmon, one of the reasons I joined Harmon was that I was allowed to publish my work. And I can't think of many companies where that would be allowed. Uh, and uh, I continue to you know, insist on that, uh, even though there's a lot of pressure sometimes that not to do that. We tend to, you know, tend to patent things if they're considered important and strategic, and then we publish. But uh, w one thing that came out of this was a standard, uh, <clears throat> an ANSI CEA standard, which basically is based on the spinorama of measuring home loudspeakers. And that's, so that's now a standard that's freely available. Uh, it's been implemented in, for example, the Clipple software. So you can buy Clipple software and get those spinoramas that we have. Some people have just read our papers and figured out how to do it. But it's, uh, you know, it's, there's not, a, it's not an accident that speakers have gotten better and better over the years. And uh, it's, it's more rare to find a really bad speaker compared to 20 years ago. So just some examples of uh, science being applied. This is a speaker that I own. Uh, it uh, sounds really good to me and to most of our listeners. It's being discontinued, I, I w just learned, and uh, they're making the last run of them. Uh, but it follows the science. The, the base is a bit wonky here, and this is largely our, it's an error in the anechoic chamber. Our chamber is only accurate down to about 60 hertz. Uh, we've tried to calibrate it, but when you put a large speaker like that and you do a vertical measurement, the woofers are way outside the calibration zone. So there's, uh, there's the, the measurements below, I don't know, 50 hertz aren't very accurate. Uh, this is uh, the Performa 226BE. 226B, uh, the 228B, and then uh, the 328B. Can you go back to the 228B for a second? Yeah. That's the speaker that we have downstairs in the Harmon room, if anyone wants to listen to, the, to that speaker there. And uh, if I can just pull in for one thing, the Salon 2, which Sean owns, is what's in my house. We spent a lot of time listening to it Friday night to your ear splitting level. <laughs> and we tried running it on channels as a set of them, and going too low as a set of those. So there, if anyone wants to hear a little bit of my place, yeah, Floyd Tool has his, his rebels are hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Upside down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, very elaborate. I couldn't do that in my living room. Because <laughs> it's like 15 foot ceilings, I'd have to have them suspended from a wire. <laughs> Salon 2 for Atlas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's probably some crazy audiophile that's going to go out and do that now that you said it. Isn't there somebody building that does that? No, I don't think so. I, I think Dolby, uh, at, at least a few years ago, they had salons in their it's reference like room. Standard for the yeah. Yeah. Like Is this the new top of the line right here? Yeah, that's the current. Uh, Perform top of the line performer. So you know, <clears throat> so what what do we do about the room? Because we we make the speaker, we ship it out, and the customer gets it, and God knows what what's going to happen when they put it in their room. And these are sort of the things that happen. Thankfully, uh, the room really is only a, a huge factor below this transition frequency which depends on the size of your room. The bigger the room, the lower this goes down. You know, if you're in a car, the transition goes up here. And th these are all uh, steady state modal uh, phenomena. Uh, when you get up here, you're into the reverberant or early reflected field, and you don't see as many, uh, many of these kinds of problems. <clears throat> this is a 
This is an example of what re uh, resonances look like. This is a really poorly designed speaker. Uh, I think it probably goes back to um, no, 1990s, maybe. It, uh, apparently it was sold in like a, one of those big box Best Buy stores or something. And it was designed apparently by a, a marketing or sales guy <laughs> for a, a company that also makes motorcycles and uh, motors for boats and lawnmowers. Yeah, I, but, uh, I don't know what company it is. But, <laughs> but <clears throat> it, it was awful. We brought it in our lab and, and we said, there's, we, we still, we, we're still competitive, you know. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, so marketing people seem to have problems hearing as well as designing speakers. But here's an example when you put a woofer in six different rooms, and we're only showing down to 100 hertz, but it's, you know, it's very, uh, it's, it changes a lot from room to room. These resonance shift up and down, the, the, the dips, the cancellations. But it's, uh, it's a problem because these are colorations that you can hear and uh, back in 1998, Floyd and I did a paper in the AES journal where we measured the detection thresholds of resonances. And <clears throat> we did it with different signals, pop music, we did it with pink noise, uh, voice, and we did them in different size rooms. We did them adding reverberation artificially uh, to study the phenomenon, and we measured them at different frequencies. So. We generally found that the audibility would depend on all these factors, which makes it really complicated when you're looking at a speaker measurement and you're trying to interpret, should I fix this problem? How audible is it? Well, it depends on the music, you know, it depends on, on the, the listening room, it depends on the recording, how much reverberation the recording has, because we found out reverberation adds repetitions to the resonance and it increases the audibility. So you can either add repetitions in your room or in the recording, and those are all, all factors. But <clears throat> the basic uh, finding was that the audibility depended on the Q of the resonance. And uh, for very high Q resonances, you can get away with you know, 10 dB peaks. If you broaden the resonance a bit to a Q of 10, uh, you can only get away with a 5 dB before it's just detectable. Uh, with a low Q resonance, it's about 3 dB. So uh, even though this may look worse to the eye, this is, they're all equally audible. And this is with pop music. If you go to a large orchestra, record it in a room hall, the detection of these things becomes even, even greater. Uh, you can only get away with was that 10 dB, uh, 2 or 3 dB, and this is this is even getting hard to measure because it's it's you know a fraction of a dB. What do you think's the worst uh, or the signal that's most sensitive to these things? Uh, no, no vocals. Surprisingly, well, first of all, vocal. If, I, if we were measuring these things down here, you, you wouldn't even excite the vocal because it's outside the range. No, it's, uh, it's pink noise. There's pink noise. There's pop music, orchestra, pink noise. Uh, I spent months listening to pink noise in, during this phase of my life. And <laughs> it caused... It caused, <laughs> it, it caused uh, serious mental anguish. <laughs> and I, I found out later, uh, it was in Northern Ireland, they, were, they would torture people by putting them in a, uh, in a quick chamber and play pink noise. And that's, in fact, what I was doing. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, was, it was just slightly worse or better than water torturing, waterboard torturing. But yeah, so it's, it's very audible, and <clears throat> the good news is you don't have to listen to Pink Noise, you can listen to Tracy Chapman, Fast Car. <laughs> and it's almost as good as that. That's on our playlist today. Yeah. Shall we have probably about five minutes? Okay, I'll speed up. So these are, these are what these resonances, these are all at threshold, and you can see what they look like in the frequency domain and what they look like in time domain. 
Uh, and the time domain, they look, you know, pretty bad, but in fact, you know, again, it's very visually deceiving. Because what looks bad visually, uh, you know, you think, oh, this is awful, but... And again, it depends on the signal. If you're listening to uh, impulses in the time domain, that, that is audible. So, so uh, you put the speaker in the room and you have direct sound, direct and early reflected, and reflected sound. And this sort of shows you where the impact in terms of frequency is the greatest. You know, direct sound is all across, you know, all across the frequency range, but a, a large portion of the high frequency sound is direct because the speaker is directional. Uh, early reflections have all, all aspects of sound, maybe a little less because by the time it bounces around the room, the high frequencies have been absorbed and the speaker's not as directional. And then <clears throat> uh, the sound power uh, is very much uh, reflected sound with, uh, and pred predominantly below five kilohertz. So with that in mind, if, if you had a speaker like the M2 that measures like this, uh, would you equalize that speaker in the room uh, fully? I'm supposed to, unfortunately, this is supposed to not be here because I'm supposed to ask you the question. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is like the Donald Trump version of the audio test. Where you, you already know the answers before the questions are asked. But yeah, you wouldn't equalize that speaker except in the bass. And, and here's the evidence. This was a study done by uh, Linda Gettimer, who was a PhD student working with us. And she went into different cinemas in LA with this M2 speaker, and she measured them at all these different cinemas with different sizes. And then she uh, measured it in our home theater, which is this size, so a very small room. And in all, situ all cases, the, they, it measured very similarly until you get down to the transition frequency and you see all kinds of variations. So there's really no need to equalize this. It's very, very similar from room to room, and you really, really need to focus on this. Um, this is an Excel calculator, which you can find. And it, I'm just going to quickly say that you can put in your room dimensions, and it will calculate the modes in the length, width, and uh, depth. And you can see that if you were to dial in a frequency here and put the speaker in the corner uh, and move your microphone or move yourself across the length of the room, the sound would go up and go down. I mean, it's quite audible. It's a very convincing demonstration. But it's all predictable. That's the, that's the point. And if you, know, <clears throat> if you know this, you can go into a room and manipulate subwo uh, subwoofers and cancel some of these modes. For example, if you have a subwoofer in this corner and put another one in the opposite corner, you can cancel this mode. And if you put it in the null, uh, you're not driving that mode at all, so it's, it's not an issue. And here's an example of using uh, two subwoofers to attenuate odd odor modes and amplify even odor modes. So it's pretty effective. And Todd Welty's done a lot of work. He's shown uh, different listening seats. And depending on where you put your subwoofers, in this case, it's at the midpoint, he can calculate what the, uh, <clears throat> what the uh, response would be at the different seats. And you can see if you manipulate where you put these, you can reduce the, the spatial variance from seat to seat. Uh, so here's another example. Uh, so anyways, this has all been very, very much uh, studied, and it's been published, and it, I think it's being practiced pretty widely now. Certainly Synthesis uses this, and other people are using it. And I just did a uh, four subwoofer uh, calibration using the Tops sound code management model. Yeah. And, and there's trade-offs between reducing the spatial variance and how efficient it is. And the most efficient positions is always putting it in the corner, which is what 
what I did. I'm going to skip through here. So here's an example. This is our reference room. I went in, put a, put a subwoofer here, and I measured at all these six seats, and this is the response of each of those six seats. I then put <clears throat> four subwoofers and then measured from seat to seat, and this is the result. So all you have to do is add a, a, a very simple equalization to that, and everyone will hear the same bass in every seat. So corners appear to be the best. If, if well, and, you know, we, we tried putting them at the midpoints, and it, it worked well. Not, not as well as we thought. It really upset Todd Welty because he's been advocating midpoints. But, <laughs> so he, he, he questions whether this was done right, but uh, we're always fighting with each other over our, each other's work. And, uh, but, but it is more efficient using these subwoofers in the corners. There's no doubt. Last thing, target curve. Uh, Floyd has written about this in his book, and he's shown that uh, the predicted in-room curve, if, if you were to put a speaker in a room and measure it, it would be very similar to what the anechoic predicted in-room curve is. And this is true except at low frequencies where the room modes really dominate. And uh, this was a, <clears throat> a study uh, different studies where we had people adjust the bass and treble. And uh, <clears throat> you can see that if the listeners are trained, they generally are choosing something that's very similar to the predicted in room curve. You use a bunch of untrained people, you might get more bass and more treble. But there's, there's a strong um, evidence that this in room target curve based on a good speaker is, is a good starting point, and uh, Tom, you yesterday you had asked about current harmon target curve, and it is that it is look very much like that one you had for trying to explain it. So yeah, yeah, and, and we that slide for a second. Thank you. The solid line. This this uh, line here, heavy dots. That's the that's the predicted in room speaker of a highly rated speaker. And we confirmed it in a, a study a few years ago where we, we applied room corrections to a satellite sub. And we compared it. <clears throat> we compared all room corrections with the speaker having no room correction. And depending on how well it's done, you can greatly improve the score. Uh, but there's also opportunity you may not do it well, and you can make it worse. And in some cases, there's, there's no difference, but it, it's clearly evident that uh, focusing on the bass, you can improve the sound. And these are the steady state in room measurements. So this is the one that's the most preferred. This is the least preferred. This dotted black curve is the speaker without any room correction. And you can see we had people, these were trained listeners, judge the spectral balance. The one that looks like that which hits the harmonic target curve, people thought that sounded neutral and flat. And the one that was, uh, had a flat, steady state in room curve was judged to be thin and lacking bass. So, so I, I don't have much time, so uh, you can read that at your will. Mm -hmm. And that's my talk. Thank you. Yeah.